All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cultish, entering the kingdom of the cults. My name is Jeremiah Roberts. I am one of the co-hosts here. Uh, very, very uh, excited for this episode. Uh, Andrew, uh, you're, I'm, how, how excited are you for this? I'm extremely excited. Today it's hailing in uh, Riverton, Utah, and I was thinking maybe it's like a fair game tactic. Some Scientologists maybe <laughs> controlling the weather over here, some yeah. matter and energy being controlled by some operating Thetans. So we're, we're getting ready to go. That means we're doing something good. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm... I'm uh, really excited because we actually have on with us someone who's uh, we have both of us have a deep appreciation for was a huge really motivation for us to even launch our podcast back when uh, Scientology the A and E show the the one Emmy Awards was launched uh, Scientology the aftermath we are here with Mike Rinder how are you doing my friend I'm terrific guys it's great to be with you today. Excellent. So uh, just for anyone who doesn't know you, I mean, I, I know you're making the media rounds and you're probably giving your just give the quick LinkedIn bio of who you are. And then we'll kind of go into just some questions we have about your book. and We're looking for this conversation. OK, I was raised a Scientologist and joined what is called the C organization of Scientology, like the inner core elite which is uh, why the title of the book is A Billion Years, because Sea Org members sign a contract for a billion years in dedicating their eternity in service of Scientology. I worked with L. Ron Hubbard personally. I rose up through the ranks and became the international spokesperson for Scientology and was on the international board of the Church of Scientology International. And I... Uh, worked directly for the current head of Scientology, David Miscavige. For many years, I escaped in 2007, uh, started a new life. Uh, literally, I escaped with nothing, just a briefcase, and that was it. No money, no, nowhere to go, no job, no family, nothing. And subsequently have become one of the more prominent whistleblowers about the abuses in Scientology. I helped with a very seminal um, series that was done in the St. Petersburg Times called The Truth Rundown, and then Larry Wright's book and the film that was made by Alex Gibney, Going Clear, and then teamed up with Leah Remini and did three seasons on A&E of Leah Remini, Scientology and the Aftermath, and now we do a podcast, and I have just written a book. Apart okay. from that, uneventful. Yes, <laughs> uh, definitely. Uh, how would you describe uh, for anyone, because we're talking about Scientology, this is part something that was part of your life, your very outspoken passion about exposing the abuses. If you were to look at like a church creed, like the Apostolic Creed or the Nicene Creed, which, which establishes their doctrine, how would you give a Cliff Notes version to explain to our audience, just in case they're living under a rock and don't doesn't know what Scientology is, how would you briefly kind of explain the fundamental tenets of what they believe doctrinally? Well, what they believe doctrinally is always difficult to describe, and Scientologists can't do it. Um, Scientology believes that man is a spiritual being who has a mind and a body. The spirit is senior to the mind and the body, and that through the teachings or writings or discoveries or technology, as Hubbard liked to to refer to it, of L. Ron Hubbard, um, one can attain spiritual salvation and freedom by rising up these levels that Hubbard uh, invented uh, that he calls the bridge to total freedom. And that that will restore you to your original spiritual being powers, which are unlimited and um, and godlike, that you uh, become uh, and can become through Scientology a, a what's called an operating Thetan. Thetan is the word that Scientology uses to, sorry about that. Thetan is the, the word that Scientology uses to describe or as a spirit, that you can become an operating Thetan or an operating spirit who has vast powers to operate outside your body, to control uh, 
what's called the, the messed universe, matter, energy, space, and time. And that you can transcend all of these things as long as you pay enough money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Andrew, just real quickly before we uh, jump into the book, what, what do you have any just quick questions just about anything that Mike said in regards to just kind of like the general uh, doctrine and beliefs of Scientology? Yeah, I, I've always wondered with regards to almost like the manipulation of uh, matter, energy, space, and time. Uh, Mike, did you ever see any like practices of people trying to do some type of manipulation of matter around them? Or was it more of manipulating of people and emotions versus trying to actually, uh, you know, do occultic practices in a sense? Yeah, it, it, no, it, that's all bullshit. That, that, that just is, you know, that's just made up stuff. And um, the manipulation and the control is of the minds of people, not the, not, uh, you know, making their pens levitate off the desk. Mm -hmm. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by HigherBond.com. I am getting married soon, but if I wasn't, I'd be checking out HigherBond.com. It's a brand new Christian dating website that takes out a lot of the awkward nuance of online dating. They have a lot of really cool features to bring back the human element into the online dating scene. One of the cool things they have is something called Guided First Messages, which makes the initial sliding into the direct messages. We all know how uncomfortable that can be. They've actually made that process extremely fun for both people involved and made a really fun, natural, organic way to date online to meet new people. And check it out. They currently are offering a three-month uh, trial, no credit card required. And who knows? You might find yourself uh, a wife, a husband, a hubby. A uh, significant other, whatever you're looking for, you can find it at higherbond.com. You can go ahead and take advantage of the three month trial. Enjoy the podcast. Okay. And uh, so I appreciate that. Now, a question um, What do you, uh, so you've been around, uh, you know, very outspoken against the Church of Scientology. Uh, 2015 is the first time that I saw you when I watched the documentary, uh, Lawrence Wright's Going Clear. I also read the book, definitely an excellent book. But all these years now, it's 2022, and you, what made what motivated you to write the book now versus previously? Like, why now write the book? Well, two things. One, I um, a lot of people had asked me to write a book for a long time, and I found it a rather daunting task, frankly. But then COVID hit, and I didn't have anything to do. We couldn't shoot TV shows. We couldn't do anything, and I was sitting around... And my wife kept saying to me, you better start writing, you better start writing, you better start writing. And I started out by writing like a, uh, not writing, by sort of listing a chronological uh, track of my uh, experiences in life and the most significant things to me um, as a kind of a, a skeleton to form and, and flesh out for a book. I then spoke to Larry Wright, and Larry Wright over the years became a, 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 almost a, a, a spirit, not a spiritual, almost like a, like a, uh, I don't know what the word is to describe it, but someone that I really looked up to, uh, his success, his intelligence, his determination to get to the bottom of things, his, you know, care and he's just a tremendously nice guy and i called him up and i said larry all these people keep asking me to write a book my wife is nagging me to write a book what's your best advice and he said my best advice to you is to write something that is meaningful to you then the audience will come the the meaningfulness is if you imbue that into your book you will succeed and he said, just knowing you, he said, what do you think my, my, the, my what I consider my best book is? I said, I don't know, Looming Tower, Going yeah. Clear. Like I started rattling off yeah. all of his Pulitzer Prize winning <laughs> number one New York Times, number one bestseller. Nope. It's a book I wrote uh, uh, concerning letters I had written to my parents because that was what was meaningful to me. And he said, knowing you, I think you should write a book addressed to your children that are still in Scientology. And I went, okay, that makes sense to me. 
that get, that sort of motivated me. And like, I want them to know whether I'm uh, dead or alive when they eventually read it. I want them to know what my life was actually like, what the thought processes that I went through were, what the my my sadness at the fact that I brought them into a world that where they have no choice, and that is why the book exists today rather than five years ago or five years from now. Yeah. No, thank you, Mike. And just, just on a personal level, like one of, uh, maybe you call it like uh, imprinting, you know, you, when you all of a sudden you see someone and you probably had a lot of people who've messaged you about certain parts of the show uh, or your book, mm-hmm. even probably now your book and how it's affected them. Even some somebody who's been in a religious abusive environment different than Scientology. Yes. Like you oh, did. Very much so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you like you did the series at the end of season three on uh, with with Leah on Jehovah's Witnesses. You were dealing with people like Lloyd Evans. You had the whole panel, which I thought was really excellent, showing just the real travesty of like you know people sim- experiencing disfellowshipping, similar to disconnection. Um, I think it was really for me. It was that moment. It was right around the first season of episode five. You were talking with a lady on the couch, and she was talking about that's all that I've been thinking of, and I can't describe it because I'll probably start welling up because that but it was like but what i admired so much about you mike was like you could have had that edited out like some people would like if, if i did that i probably would have edited it out but like you were so vulnerable to show that so like it goes to show what you're saying and the passion you have to have this be to your kids like there's so much gravitas that comes with that well jeremiah i gotta tell you that episode was with my very dear friend mary khan and her husband david and they like to this day they remain like that's who I will be spending Thanksgiving with. Um, honest, to be completely honest with you, Leah and I sort of said, no, we want that taken out. Uh, we don't want to look weak. We don't want to, and the network executive at a and who became our guardian angel and is also now a very dear friend, Devin Graham Hammonds said, Absolutely, that has to stay in. I am absolutely certain that that has to stay in. It's a really important moment. And I said, okay, Devin, you know, you're the boss. You know this, like, that was the first season. I'm, I'm like, I knew nothing about making TV shows other than just my sort of experience with going clear. But I didn't really know anything about you know, making a commercial TV show for a network and all that sort of stuff. He said, Devin, if you and the other people at A&E are absolutely convinced that this needs to stay in, I trust you. And I am very glad that I did because that moment um, impacted a lot of people. It It's one of the things of all, like there's 37 episodes of that show and the one that gets brought up the most and the moment that gets brought up the most is that one. So, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm with you. That was my first inclination. Who wants to see me breaking down? Like, <laughs> <laughs> looking looking yeah. like a, a, a child on yeah. TV, but you know, it is, it, that is what happened. It was, it's not like it was a, scripted you know planned breakdown or something it's just when mary was talking about that and her son and how she had done everything in her life to try and save that relationship and that was what her entire life was about was her her children and then it's gone that was heartbreaking now i also have to tell you jeremiah that i am quite the the softy when it comes to these things, because there is a lot of moments in that show, including the Jehovah's Witness one, where the like some of those stories in that show are so heartbreaking. I was sitting there like unable to talk. Luckily, I didn't need to, but I was definitely choked up and had tears running down my cheeks uh, just listening to the tragic destruction of families that occurred and the experiences of those people. And, you know, it was just like, oh, my God. And that happened more often than 
than once yeah. um, doing that show. Yeah. What was your biggest takeaway from when you did the special on Jehovah's Witnesses with Leah? What was your biggest takeaway from that? And like, what con- what connections did you see with Scientology? Like looking all these years back from when it was filmed. Well, there there are massive similarities between Jehovah's Witnesses and Scientology, not just in the disconnection, disfellowshipping, but also in the control of information and the control of of the thinking of the people within that bubble. And particularly when you're raised in that environment and hearing the stories of, of what life was like being raised in a family that that were true believers uh, and the scare tactics of what terrible things are going to happen to you if you don't sort of follow the path that we have dictated that you must follow. That stuff is not just Jehovah's Witnesses, not just Scientology. It's also Nexium. Like I've become so I've become very friendly with Sarah Edmondson and Mark Vicente from The Bow, and I watch The Bow now, and I go, oh, my God, Keith Raniere just copied Scientology. He's just like a, a complete copycat. And then I've watched a whole bunch of other documentaries, you know, the Way Down one about oh, yeah. evangelical weight loss lady in wherever that was. With lots Tennessee. of lots of Aquanet. <laughs> with some crazy yeah. hair. <laughs> yeah, that hair is like... That hair was astonishing. And I, I see similarities in all of these organizations. And of course, I talked to Chris Shelton and Steve Hassan and a lot of other experts on this subject, Rachel Bernstein and Yanja Lalich and all these people. And they all have um, a similar sort of perspective that while there are uh, differences in the details, the similarities in the big picture between these organizations are are pretty remarkable and pretty documentable. Yeah. Hey, hey, Mike, uh, with regards to your book, a, a Billion Years, what you're kind of talking about is almost the mind prison, right? To use one of your terms in the book that all of these cults essentially create for their followers. I think you paint a really good illustration with regards also to your vulnerability. Um, you, you paint this illustration so that your children, Taryn and Benjamin, can kind of understand what this mind prison mm-hmm. is. For, for our listeners, can you describe that illustration that you make? Because I think it's a very uh, tangible way for our audience to understand what it's like being within that mind prison. Right. I I describe it, Andrew. I I try to come up with this analogy that I thought, okay, let's take this outside the world of Scientology and and analogize it to something. And I I describe uh, being born into a house uh, with a wall around it, a a high wall, and that the people inside the house believe that everything outside of that wall is evil and is intent on on their destruction and killing them and that this house inside the wall is the most magnificent uh, perfect environment that doesn't exist anywhere else on on earth and that it's it's very difficult when you have been raised and grow up in a house like that to believe that the best course of action for you would be to jump over that wall or try and scale that wall or break through that wall in some way because the the downsides that you have been uh, forewarned about on the other side are horrendous. They are, they, it is death and destruction, pain and agony for all eternity should you breach that wall. And not ever having seen outside the wall, it is very easy for someone to believe that that is what is out there. And I try and describe to my my son and daughter, look, I did jump over the wall. The other side ain't bad. In fact, in many respects, it's much better. And I say at the beginning of the book that this book is an effort, like since I got over the wall, I've been trying to shout back into the house saying, 
it's not so bad in there. It, it's not, it's just not bad out here. What you've been told isn't true. It's not bad. It's, it's all okay. You can, you can walk out there. You can walk back too if you want, but you can come out and that I've been throwing rocks over the wall with notes on them and dropping things from planes and use, and that this book is another effort to get the message inside the wall. Hmm. No, I, I appreciate you sharing that. And in the book, you kind of talk about uh, like your how you got into Scientology at a young age. And prior to you getting into Scientology, what, what sort of li- religious background did you have? None. I mean, I got into Scientology when I was five or six, and my parents were not religious. Uh, they, I don't ever remember going to any church or Sunday school or anything. Just Okay. Yeah. And what, what was like that process like? I mean, you, you talked about, you know, in your younger years, eventually you got into the Sea Org. Just like, what was some of the initial transitions? And in that time, I mean, this is pretty much what you grew up knowing. Were there any times where it was kind of that question mark, the exclamation point kind of goes above your head? Like, wait a minute, I have something's kind of weird here. Or is you just kind of just go along to get along? What was the earlier years like for you? Like, because you do talk about it in your book. Well, the earliest, the early years are, are, there was no doubt in my mind. It was okay. My parents get into Scientology, and one of the things about Scientology is that L. Ron Hubbard has the answers to everything. And I talk in the book about learning at an early age to figure out how to deal with situations in life or problems or things that come up by doing what Ron says. And that's a, a, a phrase that is used a lot in Scientology and by Scientologists, meaning find out what Hubbard had to say about this because he's got answers to everything. And if you find out what he has to say, it'll tell you how to go about doing what or solving the problem or whatever it is that is going on in your life. And, you know, I give examples in the book of the first things that were somewhat innocuous that my mother would start, you know, using these little pieces of Scientology and then sending me into the local Scientology organization where I had a bunch of other friends that I hung out with and we were sort of the Scientology kids, even though nobody else knew we were involved in Scientology at all because at that time, it was a sort of a dangerous thing, but even the danger of being involved in Scientology as a child, because there was an inquiry in, in Victoria, Australia in the early 60s that banned, resulted in Scientology being banned in that state, and then other actions being taken in other states, which was, I lived in Adelaide at the time. Um, but that, that fear that the government was engaged in a conspiratorial campaign to destroy Scientology was something that was ingrained in me from a very early age and something that you see Hubbard talking about constantly. And subsequently, that was an experience that I had that I went, oh, yeah, Ron's right about that. He's exactly right. The government's out to try and destroy Scientology because it's the only hope for mankind and blah, 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 blah. So the early years of my life were very much, um, oh, you know, I'm a Scientologist. I don't uh, admit it to anyone because it's not safe to do so, but it works for me and my family and you know, there were advantages to it. We went to England twice when I was a, a teenager, and that was like a big upside sailing across the world on a cruise ship and seeing the world and going and living in England. Um, then when I joined the Sea Organization, which was sort of a preordained path for me, I, you know, raised in Scientology, the greatest accomplishment that you can have with, is to go work with L. Ron Hubbard. And that's what I did. And I guess the real big first shock for me was arriving on Hubbard's yacht, um, which was an old cattle ferry um, in Lisbon, Portugal, to join him and the other most dedicated members of the sea organization 
the ultimate pinnacle of Scientology accomplishments and finding out that the place was a dirty, smelly shithole and that I was a commodity that had no say in what was happening to me and my life, but now being stuck somewhere with, you know, no way out and also the sort of stigma of, you know, I've arrived at the pinnacle of Scientology. I can't walk away from this because I don't like the smell of where I'm sleeping. And I go into some detail at that particular moment about the thoughts that were going through my head. And those thoughts and the rationale and justification for why you put up with stuff that, like, I look back now and go, <laughs> boy, I really was just brainwashed to, to put up with that shit. But it, that, that reinforced, um, you know, ideas that everybody else around you has that this is the way things should be and if they don't see something they're not complaining why would you be complaining and all of these ideas that are inculcated in scientology that if something is bad around you or bad happening to you it's your fault all of those things uh played very heavily on my uh failure to escape far earlier than i ultimately did yeah mm. No, thank you, Mike. Andrew, just real quickly, um, you may like something you said actually made me kind of skip ahead. We were going to talk about fair game. I remember I saw that post about the guy who wrote the response "A Billion Lies" by uh, by Ryan Prescott. Definitely pulled surprise material. We'll jump into in a second. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, oh, I was trying to find it somehow. I misplaced it. I wanted to show you. It's, it's so over the top. We'll, we'll jump into that. But um, just a question real quick, because you, you mentioned the Victoria Magazine article. And, you know, Scientology saw depicted they had this notorious fair game policy with the enemies of Scientology. You depict a lot of the people who are, you know, media conglomerates who are writing articles and pieces, investigative journalism. Uh, both Andrew and I, we're both Christians. Were there, are you aware of any uh, churches, Christian ministries that were outspoken against Scientology? Because I know as you talk about in your documentaries, part of it was looking to people who are critical of Scientology. Is that something that was involved on top of the regular media outlets you talk about in your book? Um, there hasn't been any, there, there was sort of a problem, honestly, Jeremiah, with, with uh, the, the mainstream Christian organizations getting on board with respect to, uh, you know, doing something about Scientology. And that is, I, I, and, there is one massive exception that I mentioned in the book that we talked to on the aftermath, which is Pastor Willie Rice of the Calvary Baptist Church in Clearwater, which is the biggest Southern Baptist church in, in Pinellas County, and maybe even in the Tampa Bay area. And he is a magnificently outspoken critic of Scientology and has been and has been supportive of Leah and me and everybody who has ever who has ever said anything. But there is a problem with what I call the religious right, which is that the, the idea that the First Amendment protection of religious belief and practice must be upheld at all costs is seen by many of these organizations and, and their lawyers in particular as we have to be careful on the edges because the edges form the slippery slope. If Scientology goes down because they ha haven't been able to use the protections of the First Amendment to shield their activities, the next will be the big time evangelicals that make huge amounts of money and live in mansions and, and fly in their G6s. And then ultimately it will erode and come for us. And this is, this is very 
problematic from my perspective. I've written about it on my blog a number of times that conservative judges tend to tend to be very, very bad for those seeking legal recourse with respect to Scientology. Scientology has played this game of, you know, making people sign contracts and uh, requiring that they go to, quote, religious arbitration, which actually there is no such thing, but, and that courts have sided with Scientology on that, at least conservatively, conservative judges have sided with Scientology, worrying that if they erode that for Scientology, then they're going to be eroding freedoms for other more mainstream religions. So no, there hasn't been a whole, and, and honestly, it's kind of crazy because Scientology is actually anti-Christian, like anti, not just they're, they're agnostic about it. Hubbard said that, you know, Christ on the stat Christ on a cross was a, just a figment of the implants done by psychiatry 75 million years ago, and it's used to control people. And the Catholic Church is evil, and they're the biggest uh, source of evil on the planet outside of psychiatry. And you know a lot of stuff. He even created in the 1950s a a quote church called the Church of American Science, which had as its purpose to pretend to people that they were sort of like a Christian organization to get them in and then explain to them that there was something very wrong with Christianity and move them over to Scientology. It was like a front group with, with an actual, actual plan of how to go about doing this because Christianity was so bad. So this Scientology is anti-Christian, despite their PR crap that they try and go out and hang out with other religious leaders just to give them some credibility. It's, it's like Scientology is, is duplicitous in its presentation to the world versus what it actually believes. And this is one of my big issues with with Scientology is, hey, if you're going to be, if you're going to be um, homophobic or anti-gay, at least say you are. Don't pretend that you're not and then do it behind, behind closed doors. If you're going to be pro-abortion, don't pretend that you're not and claim that you're, you know, pro-life. It, it's like this is Scientology sort of 101 that there is a presentation to the world of this is what we are and who we are. And the reality is very different. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, that's that, good. I, go ahead, I, I really agree with a lot of the sentiment there. We, um, I don't know if you are familiar with Walter Martin. He wrote the book, the kingdom of the cults, but he actually quotes, uh, this man named JK Van Balen. He says that the cults are the unpaid debts of the church. Uh, so one of the reasons why we actually have our podcast as Christians is we want to preach the truth of the gospel to the people that are in the cults or have a ministry to help them get out of the cults and into Christ. Like that's the main focus of our podcast at least. Uh, so I agree with those sentiments on, uh, so many different levels, uh, bringing it back just a little bit. Cause I, I, I want to go back into your book and some of, uh, before you get onto the Apollo, right. Mm -hmm. Before you get onto that boat, uh, you said some things where you're talking about, you, you didn't really question it too much because there was things that happened into your life, uh, that led you into these circumstances. Like the, the mind prison wall had been slowly building and it was up high enough to this chance to, uh, at this point to where you weren't looking over in a sense, you, you were in it. This is still the golden capsule. This is where you're going to, uh, work for L Ron Hubbard directly work up the ranks and do whatever you have to do. But before that, uh, I want to go back to your childhood because I think this is just so interesting back in Adelaide. When you were six, you talked about, uh, children's communication courses that were be being done. And this is type of like the wall that is being built in mm -hmm. your mind prison. Can you explain to our listeners what those courses included with the bull baiting and the techniques or technology, shall I say that they were having you do at six years old? This was, this was mind blowing to me, to be honest. I was like six years old <clears throat> children doing this. Can you explain that? Yeah. Um, and, and this is still goes on in Scientology to this day. I mean, there, uh, the idea that children, are uh, 
Now, the idea in Scientology is that children are old spirits in young bodies, that they too, that they just have limitations because of their body size, not because they're, they're you know, young and unformed. It, it's a sort of a, a strange concept, but the Hubbard um, developed this thing that he called auditing which is Scientology one-on-one -on -one counseling. And in order to train auditors to do things the way that he wanted them to do, he developed these things that he called training routines, or in Scientology, they're shorthanded and called TRs, training routines. And these are things that are supposed to teach the counselor how to deal with the person that they are counseling. But it is also Hubbard's contention that this is the technology of how you communicate effectively. That if you are able to, to do these training routines, it will teach you how to communicate, not just as an auditor in an auditing session, but in life and with your family and with in relationships. So it's a very important thing and is given great uh, prominence in Scientology, training routines. And people who first come into Scientology are often put onto these training routines as a way of indoctrinating them into some fundamental Scientology concept. So the first step is if you want to communicate to someone, you have to be able to look at them. You have to be able to sit comfortably uh, across from them and simply stare at them. And this is where the idea that stare, Scientologists stare comes from. It, and it's valid, you know. Scientologists have to sit and literally three feet across from another person sit and stare them in the eyes. And if you blink or if you smile or if you laugh or if you cringe or whatever, you're told plunk and start over. And you keep going. And this can go on for hours and hours and hours. And once you are able to sit comfortably and sit across from someone and just look at them comfortably, then it goes into bull baiting, which Andrew mentioned. And bull baiting is the idea that the now one person is sitting there trying to look at the other one, and the other one is trying to distract him. The other one is trying to prevent him from maintaining a, you know, not cracking up, not cringing, not reacting in any way, shape, or form. And you're sort of able to do anything you want. You can tell jokes, you can, you know, you can't punch or slap, but you, you're not supposed to touch, but you can, you can use facial expressions. You can, you can jump up and down, you can, anything you want. And, and as a kid, this was great fun because we got to say things and do things that might otherwise have been unacceptable and use language that might otherwise have been unacceptable that we'd heard from others but weren't supposed to use, that sort of stuff. But this is, and Leah and I have talked about this on our podcast quite a bit, this is actually a way of grooming people. Grooming people for sexual abuse subsequently in life because oftentimes what happens is if there is a girl or a young woman or a woman who is undergoing this and there is a man on the other side of that the man will start on sex talk and implication and the the idea is you don't react to anything so this abusive, uh, what would be very, very offensive things in, you know, in anybody's workplace go on in these TR bull bait sessions and people are literally trained not to react to them. And so this is a, a, a terrible process of grooming children and young adults to accept the most 
outrageous things being said to them and not to react in any way. Wow. No, that's that, that's really heavy. And, and again, that's why if anyone hasn't watched it, I would say just watch all three seasons. It was it was just on Netflix. I think it just came off of Netflix. Um, yeah, it but, did. But yeah, it's definitely, I would say, check out the show because it explains a lot of this stuff for sure. Moving forward, uh, L. Ron Hubbard, you talk about your time on The Apollo. Uh, the movie The Master was still at me, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. How, that's kind of like a weird non-Scientology movie. Like, how how is that in comparison to like what actually like took place? Because a lot of times people will try and have ideas. You know, even in your world, it's very easy to sensationalize something. And in Hollywood, they're to, they're there to make a production, right? Um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna disappoint you terribly, Jeremiah. I never watched it. You didn't? Oh, I thought you would have gone through. And I was here. <laughs> I was watching here later on your book when you left and um, you you when you oh. left Scientology, you been through all those movies. Like, oh, the master had to be one of them. Um, no, no. Anyways, I don't, I don't need anybody to give me their uh, their version of what L. Ron Hubbard was like. I got my own. Oh yeah, well, just just a little bit. Yeah, tell, take us into that world of like life on the Apollo real quickly for our audience. Well, life on the Apollo is, is one thing. My experiences with Hubbard, you know, like in in very up close and personal actually came subsequently in La Quinta in Southern California, which is where he was operating out of um, in the, the late 1970s. And I went there and there was a small handful of people that were there with him. And that was where I was with him like 24 hours a day as what's known as a Commodore's messenger. Uh, someone that that is sort of his I don't know, like servants, I guess. Um, Hubbard was uh, a master storyteller. He is capable of telling a story about anything and everything. And frankly, he did tell stories about anything and everything. Um, and he, you know, it's sort of an interesting arc that I have with respect to Hubbard, because when I escaped Scientology or escaped the Sea Organization, I still believed in Scientology. I still believed in L. Ron Hubbard. He had convinced me, along with everybody else that's a Scientologist, that he came up with the answers to things that nobody else in history has ever come up with. And it wasn't until some years after escaping that I, the, the distance from that world of Scientology and that, that mind prison of Scientology had let in enough light that I was able to start looking at Hubbard. And a very seminal a book for me was Russell, Miller, Russell Miller's unauthorized biography of Hubbard called The Face Messiah. And that book really sort of shook my world as far as L. Ron Hubbard went because Russell Miller is, a, is like uh, Larry Wright, uh, an incredibly detailed researcher and has a bibliography, notes and sources for everything and had done uh, and a huge amount of work to document the life of L. Ron Hubbard. And what I learned from that book was that from a very, very early age, Hubbard told stories about himself, about his experiences. Then he told stories to make a living uh, as a Pulp Fiction writer. Then he started inventing things to create a create Dianetics and then subsequently Scientology with all sorts of claims about his research and how he had discovered this and discovered that. It was all bullshit. He just made he he took a lot of things and he he sort of distilled them or modified them or turned them into something that sounds really amazing and he he built a an empire out of now the stories that he told that 
uh, supposedly the foundational scripture of Scientology. And that's what Scientology is. Scientology is the, the result of the storytelling abilities of L. Ron Hubbard. It's just interesting to me, uh, the similarities, Mike, when you're uh, talking about uh, L. Ron Hubbard, and then I think of Joseph Smith uh, from Mormonism. He was also an amazing storyteller, and there's fingerprints all over the Book of Mormon to show that the Book of Mormon is not a divine book. Uh, but like you're saying with L. Ron Hubbard, there's fingerprints essentially in these stories and the storytelling and Dianetics and technologies that he's inventing, that he's taking things from things that are going on around in his life, uh, which I find extremely fascinating. And you talked about how even when you left the Sea Org, you were still essentially a Scientologist in mind. Uh, did you find that it was kind of like your identity had been replaced at such a young age to think not like you are L. Ron Hubbard? Because I, I would assume that L. Ron Hubbard doesn't think like anybody within the Sea Org. He wants them to think a specific way, but that you were pretty much like a, a product of someone who thought, well, what would Ron L. Hubbard do in all of uh, these situations, like your identity was now the technologies. So like over in your life, you had to like reverse engineer somehow these technologies that you had been uh, trained in to try to find out who Mike was again. Is that I something that you find? That, that is a, as an astonishingly accurate, accurate glimpse that I never really have thought about that way. But I think that that's very true. I mean, I say uh, a number of times in the book, you know, for the first time, when I escaped the Sea Org, for the first time in my life, I didn't have a, a set of rules and restrictions and regulations, and this is what you must do now, and this is how you must think about this, and this is how you must think about that. And that was uh, both incredibly freeing and also very scary, because... It took a long time, and I'm not sure that I've even reached that point yet, to figure out what is it that is my perspective and what is it that is the perspective on things that I was taught to have as a perspective on things. Like, uh, for a long time, I would stop, and, and me and my wife, who's also a former Sea Org member, would stop and go, wait a minute. Did we just say something that is based on what we were told we were supposed to believe or we were supposed to think about that way? Or is that what we really think? And we, we would do that routinely. And I guess as time has gone by, that's become less and less as I have figured out and understood what it was that was, you know, hammered into me to look at this way or that way. And, but it, it is, this is not a process that happens with the snap of your fingers. The snap of your fingers is jumping over the wall. That is a snap of the fingers. There is a moment that happens with everybody where they finally go, I've had enough, I'm done. Nothing could be worse than this. I'm over the wall. But when you get over the wall, figuring out where you're going and how to get there and, where, and not turn around and reverse yourself back inside the wall again by accident or by habit or by routine is not so easy. It is a real process to get through that and come to terms with yourself and come to terms with your interaction with the rest of the world without the crutch of what is wrong to say. You know, I believe that a lot of people stay in Scientology because it's easy. Like, it's very difficult in some respects, and in other respects, it's really easy. You are told exactly what you should think, exactly how you should react to everything, exactly what's expected what's right what's wrong it's all laid out and you don't have to make any decisions really other than i'm going to be a good scientologist and if mm -hmm. i'm a good scientologist i know exactly what it is that i'm supposed to do next mm -hmm. 
Sorry for interrupting your currently scheduled programming, but did you know you can go to ApologiaStudios.com and become an all-access member? With all-access membership, you get exclusive content from all of Apologia Studios productions. Not to mention Cultish is an Apologia Studios production, so you'll get access to Cultish The Aftermath, where Jerry and I talk together after our most recent series, discussing what we thought. It's really cool. We have a lot of fun doing it. And, you know, we can't do this without the studio. It keeps the lights on. And we can't also do this without you. So please go to ApologiaStudios.com and become an all-access member. Now back to the programming. David Miscavige, that is a name that comes to mind for anyone who's followed your story and what you put forth about him. What I really noticed, Mike, in your book is that it's not just a book about you, and you can tell me about this. It felt like I was sort of watching a linear timeline, almost like a true crime story, but from somebody else's perspective, somebody else's vantage point, maybe like a third person or breaking the fourth wall. Um, like, how would you describe, in just a couple of paragraphs, how would you describe David Miscavige? I mean, he's such, I, I'm just, I have, so, I have a couple of questions about him, but how would you describe him? Um, sociopath. Malignant narcissist, uh, someone who um, his primary motivation in life is what is good for David Miscavige. Like I laughed last night when I was watching The Vow with my wife, and I forget who it was, a Lauren Saltzman, I think. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that whole show, but he, she was one of the disciples of, of Keith Ranieri. And she said, you know, and she had a relationship with him for many years, like many other women. And he insisted that she be faithful to him. But meanwhile, he had like 20 wives or whatever. So she says, I believed that and I knew I loved Keith. It was a shock to me to find out that Keith didn't love me, Keith only loved Keith. And uh, uh, that's a bit of a paraphrase, but it, and she put it actually more eloquently, I thought, wow, that is a state, that's a one sentence statement that sums up what a malignant narcissist or a sociopath is. They persuade people to be loyal to them, they persuade them to sacrifice themselves for them, they persuade people to do things that are against their better nature and certainly not in their best interest in order to support and, and prop them up. And yet the only thing that is important to them in the end is themselves and what's good for them. So what is good for David Miscavige is what is good for Scientology. What is good for David Miscavige is what is good for every Scientologist. What is good for David Miscavige is the only thing that matters. And that is very similar to L. Ron Hubbard and probably very similar to everybody who has been a cult leader ever in the past or in the future. That what is good for the cult leader is the only thing that is actually important and somehow everybody is persuaded that their sacrifices and their loyalty and their blood, sweat, and tears and their devotion and et cetera is going to be reciprocated somehow. And the ultimate, the ultimate kicker of all of these things is it never is. Yeah. And in the Ted Koppel interview that that was Miscavige's only public appearance, you were behind the scenes. And if I'm not mistaken, Koppel in the interview stated at that time that Miscavige was 31 years old, right? Um, 31. I think that I think that. Do you right. remember? That was in 1993, right? Right, and that's why I want to maybe. I think that's. I think that makes him. I think he was born in 1960 or 61. So okay. 32 or something like that. Yeah. The reason why I ask is because I was trying to put two and two together because uh, Ted Koppel in the interview when I was watching, he said, "Oh well, Miscavige, this is his first public interview since he took over the Church of Scientology ten years ago, which means he would have been t around 21 when he took over." Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's, like, who does, I mean, think about what I was doing at 21. I didn't take over a major world religion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Well, I, I would dispute whether it's a major world religion, right, but right. I, an organization with billions of dollars, exactly. absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's what I meant to know, say. He, he I, like I said, David Miscavige had had designs on rising up the ranks. I, you know, he will have scratched and clawed, uh, beat and kicked his way to the top and has not relinquished power ever since. And, you know, you gotta, you gotta give some credit where credit is due because he was a, a, you know, he came out of nowhere. He was a nobody. He wasn't one of the the people who had been with Hubbard from the early years of Scientology or even the early years of the Sea Organization. He just showed up and and made himself uh, indispensable in some fashion and ultimately maneuvered himself into a position where he was able to take over despite the fact that the logical heirs to the Hubbard Empire were not him. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense, because did you watch all of The Vow yet, Mike? Yes. Well, yes. All, all the way to the episode that was on yesterday, which is the last one that's available. Gotcha. Okay, so with regards to uh, Nexium in uh, the Inter- Enterprise Success Program that is offered, and with David Miscavige, it, it seems like, you know, Scientology or Nexium is like this pyramid scheme in a sense. It seems like David was able to get out of the pyramid in order to get to the top of the pyramid because the pyramid's designed that you never get to the top of it. So right. how, how, how can someone do that essentially? Cause like the enterprise success program, kind of like L Ron Hubbard with the philosophies is to find someone's ruin, right? Whether it be like you say in your book, anger, insecurities, management problems, and then to tell them that through Scientology, they can be cured from those ailments, although they never reach the top of the pyramid. Just like in Nexium, they do the same thing. They find that ruin, and then it's the ESP program that is to help them. How, how do you think David managed a way, if you can just speculate, to, to get out of replacing his own individuality in groupthink and retain some form of progress to the top of the pyramid? Well... I don't know that I can answer this very, very simplistically, Andrew. I tried to lay this out as best I could in the book, and it's probably the only time that this this has been described, the the rise of David Miscavige in Scientology to take over from L. Ron Hubbard and how he eliminated all potential threats to his ability to do that. Uh, he certainly couldn't have done it when L. Ron Hubbard was still around. I think that the difference is once you lose the the dictator of an organization like that, a pyramid scheme, whatever you want to call it, a hierarchical, structured, money-making business, wh- however you, whatever you call it, once the top guy, and particularly when the top guy is the guy who sort of set the the tone and standards and everything about the entire organization the entire time once that guy's gone there is a vacuum and if you can kick claw maneuver strategize your way to figuring out how to be the one that fills that vacuum you're going to end up being the guy who runs the show and miscavige the two people who ultimately were more were, were in the position who should have taken over, which was Pat and Annie Broker, which were the two people that were with Hubbard when he was hiding in his Bluebird motorhome, tra- traveling around in California, scared of being subpoenaed. Those two people, because of the the sort of remoteness and the out of touchness that they had uh, by necessity because they were with Hubbard, they had a huge disadvantage that Miscavige took advantage of. And Miscavige knew he controlled all the lawyers for Scientology. He controlled where the bank accounts were. He controlled the the people within the C or, the top of the C organization. So he had. He sort of marshaled his resources and deployed them in a fashion to make sure that he was the one that took over. 
Mm-hmm. Another question I have too, when it comes to um, uh, when you left, so yeah, you left the Church of Scientology, and this is just group thing. And I'm, I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit too, uh, Mike. Is um, I, I thought about this is your first job vocation uh, post Scientology was a used car salesman. And well, new, new and used. New and used. Okay, there is there is a stigma though that sometimes comes with like a used car salesman, and I was just genuinely curious: was there any anything like in Scientology that maybe was like helpful? And you, because you said you did really well, but also was there any part of it where it was like, oh my gosh, I'm I'm selling like a Scientologist, like I'm unthinking in this process, like because someone's sitting across. I have to think, someone's sitting across from you, you're selling them a car. There's got to be something that like flashes back to say this is kind of like a weird like audit. Does anything like auditing come to mind where you're trying to sell them to go up the bridge? I don't know. I'm just just that just popped in my well, head when I read the book. Honestly, I I um I never tr- I never sold Scientology to anybody. I sold it on a big scale as a public relations person, but I didn't try and get down and get people to write a check to me. N- it never happened. I never ever done in Scientology what's called registration, which is taking people's money. But the thing that was most beneficial to me about my experiences in Scientology when I became a car salesman was my work ethic. I was used to working seven days a week, 16, 18 hours a day. When I went and started working at this car dealership that, you know, They worked five days a week. Some of them worked six. I'd work seven. It was like no big deal. I, you know, arriving at nine and leaving at eight o'clock at night was no big deal to me. It was like, oh, I'm living the life of luxury. Everybody else, if they were staying on the late shift until 8 p.m., they started at 1 p.m. Or if they started at nine, they left at five. I just came in at nine o'clock and worked until eight o'clock every night. So I was doing more work than anybody. You know, there, there's, a, there's an adage in car sales. You know, the number of people you talk to is equal to the number of sales that you make. If, if, you, if you literally talk to more people, you're going to make more sales. And, you know, I guess I always sort of imagined myself as a uh, fairly good communicator with people and had a, and I've got to tell you another thing that really made me successful, believe it or not, my accent. People like to talk to someone that sounds different and is a bit sort of, a bit sort of exotic and Oh, yeah, I want to talk to the Australian guy. I want to talk to the guy with a weird accent. Oh, we came in here and he said something to us and we come back here because we want to see him again. You know, that bizarrely, or maybe not even, it's not even really bizarre, but that was a factor that helped. And I don't know. I. It's funny. I got this very... Um, I, got, I, I sort of started on this path of my personal belief being to do what I thought was the right thing to do. And I, I applied that when I was selling cars. Like when someone came in and they were looking for, you know, a $20,000 car, and then I'd sit down with them to find out whether they could really afford it, and they'd say, uh, you know, I'd look at their finances and go, you can't afford this. I would tell them that. I would say, look, I could sell you a $20,000 car and make more money, but I really think it's the wrong thing for you to do. Listen to me. This is what I think you should be doing. Here is how I think this could work. This is what I think would be best for you. I'm giving you my best advice. If you want to buy that car, go ahead. But here is my best advice. And I really took it to heart. I really was like, you know, I was an honest used car sales. Yeah. I just want you to know that. <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering too, like thinking back uh, to when you were doing the fair game type of tactics, like 
I would believe as a Christian that we want to love our neighbor. That's something that's innate within humans is we want to love our neighbors. So how, how, when you're doing the fair game tactics, or at least describe it to our listeners, how were you able to justify uh, doing things in the fair game tactics that you did to, uh, to others while still wanting to do the best for the world? Does that make sense? Like, cause like the Scientology right. motto is through technology, yeah. you can save the world, but then there's the fair, fair game tactics. Well, you, you just hit upon it exactly. The idea is that Scientology is the salvation for every man, woman, and child on earth. And it is the only salvation. It is the only thing that can save you, Andrew, you, Jeremiah, your wives, your loved ones, the people down the street, the people in China, everybody on planet Earth must have Scientology. And if they don't, they are doomed to an eternity of pain and suffering and blackness. That is what is used to justify. So if there is someone out there who is seeking to stop that from happening, by saying bad things about Scientology, uh, you know, writing media articles that uh, that might scare people away or prevent them from finding the truth of Scientology, the sacrifice of those people is a very, very small price to pay for the salvation of eight billion others, and that is the ultimate justification that is used for. All of Hubbard's policies, this is one of the things that is so unique about Scientology, is that Hubbard wrote about how you destroy the enemies of Scientology in detail. Hubbard considered and, and told stories that he was a great intelligence officer in the Navy in World War II. Total bullshit. But he then went about describing all of these things that Scientology or Scientologists are supposed to do in order to deal with critics. And, and this includes like having case offices and cutouts and phony, you know, information gathering and creating false rumors and setting people up for things. All of this sort of intelligent spy stuff, that is documented in Scientology. It's laid out. It's still there. The problem, the problem with Scientology is it can't change. It is uh, an organization that was born in the Cold War era, and it continues to this day with the same pattern of operation and dictates that Hubbard laid out in the early years that can never be changed because everything is based on the writing of L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah, I um, it, it reminds me of it. in Proverbs twelve ten. It says the mercy of the wicked is cruel, meaning that there's cruel things that are done in the name of mercy when it's not merciful. Uh, in it, in and of itself, like the fair game tactics, and it even seems like within Scientology that the fair game tactics aren't only used on people who are uh, SPs or WOGs in a sense, the outside world, but it's also used to control people in Scientology. Like it was used to control you. Like you were sent to this place called the hole or to walk around a tree or to jump in a pool with all your clothes on. Can you, can you explain uh, some of those things that you went through personally that I, I, I would call that spiritual abuse and spiritual trauma? Yes. And I agree with you. That is exactly what it is. It is mind fuckery. It is, that is the mind prison. Um, in sort of encapsulated. The whole is something that was depicted in Going Clear, uh, or at least one small part of it. I give a much broader, lengthier uh, rendition of what the whole was because I was one of the founding members. Uh, the whole was a, a prison that was created on the property of the International Headquarters of Scientology in Riverside County where people were incarcerated, myself included, and ended up uh, engaging in all sorts of physical abuses in order to squeeze confessions out of people uh, that supposedly would pr prove that they were now 
worthy of serving David Miscavige. And these, these sort of sadistic activities and, you know, throwing people in slimy lakes with their clothes on and, you know, running around the pole in 110 degree heat, that sort of stuff is the, the physical manifestations of the mental torture that was occurring. Um, and the mental torture is far more difficult to, to grasp viscerally. It is far more difficult to describe, but it is far more effective. Larry Wright called his book, Going Clear, Scientology in the Prison of Belief, because that is what Scientology is. It is a prison of belief. Hey, what's up, everyone? We love that you are enjoying our content on a weekly basis, but this program cannot continue and wouldn't be possible without your support. So if you want to go to thecultistshow.com, there is a donate tab. You can either support us one time or you can become a monthly partner with us that will allow us to continue this program, allow us to continue to be salt and light to the kingdom of the cults. So please go to thecultistshow.com forward slash donate and you can support us one time or monthly. Also, make sure you check out our merchandise store. Go to shopcultish.com. You can see all of our great designs. A lot of you have have gotten merchandise from us already. So again, you either go to shopcultish.com and check out all the awesome merch. Back to the show. Yeah, and also when you talk about just a prison of belief, but specifically uh, propaganda, I want to jump into some of the fair dang came tax when it comes to really, I would even appeal, you know, as a Christian, I appeal like the Ten Commandments, don't bear false witness. Uh, so a billion lies that we posted on our social media right next to your book. <laughs> and I just want to read the introduction. I'll let you kind of describe this because, uh, I'll let you, uh, of course, I'm going to let you sec- set the record straight. Um, I know we're all shaking our boots here. I'm a little nervous here, but it says... Uh, the purpose of this work is to provide you with a different view on Mike Rinder, the one he desperately tries to bury. When Rinder was in the Church of Scientology, he was not considered as someone who had authority. He was someone. He was a disrespectful person with a major self-importance problem. And then he just goes on and he says uh, he is on a campaign to spread false information about Scientology to get back at David Miscavige, the, the ecclesiastical leader of the religion, for expelling him after the leader discovered all his breaches to commonsensical policies and his resonance to using the church, uh, any policy or directive of the church. And this is my render was a nightmare to work with in the highest when the highest ranks of the church threw him out. Just paraphrasing it. Explain what you were like. Explain maybe just talk about who Ryan Prescott. You kind of described him in that post on our social media, but that like his thing is all indicative of the propaganda side of the fair game of Scientology. Well, that's true. Ryan Prescott is is literally a nobody. I think he, like, unfortunately, I think he is being taken advantage of. Um, he, if you've ever watched any of his videos, I mean, he. I, I, I don't I don't know him personally, so I don't want to say something, but he's like a little unbalanced I, is the best, the kindest way that I can put it. He was never in the C organization. He's never been anywhere near me. He's never been anywhere near David Miscavige. He wrote that, uh, wrote, uh, that book was compiled for him to put his name on before my book was even published. It claims to be, you know, refuting the the things that are in the book but it actually came out before it was even published so you know how how he's refuting stuff in a book that he hasn't read is a little hard to fathom but you know those sort of things don't tend to strike um strike these people as being important um and you know it, it's kind of interesting scientology rewrites history about everyone this is another thing that is sort of common to well it's certainly pervasive in scientology but i believe it's common to a lot of these sort of high control groups is when someone who's prominent uh leaves the fold suddenly they become a very bad person that everybody knew was very bad all along even though when I escaped, I was literally in London, England, being the international spokesperson for Scientology. I had just been interviewed by John Sweeney. And 
of the BBC Panorama show. Um, and I was on the board of directors of the Church of Scientology International. What is also pretty amazing is that Hubbard claims that he has all the technology for everything. And, and that includes administrative technology and how to train executives and how to pick your people and how to know whether someone is a good employee or a bad employee. And yet every person from the senior echelons of Scientology who has left, myself, Marty Rathbun, Tom DeVocht, Mark Headley, Claire Headley, like I could just keep going on this list, Amy Scobie, Matt, blah, 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 blah. Every one of us, when we have now escaped, is suddenly, oh my God, they were a hopelessly useless person that couldn't do anything. They were liars, they were cheats, they were stealing, they were this, they were that. But every one of those people that I just named were in very, very senior positions in Scientology for years and years and years. I was on stage at every international Scientology event for 20 years, <laughs> you know, and now suddenly after the fact, I not only don't know anything, I was also a criminal the whole time and I had no morals, I was a liar, I was a cheat and a thief, but I was also raised a Scientologist. So, <laughs> you know, wh which way do you want it, guys? Do you want the, the people who were lauded as the senior officials of Scientology to all be known as liars, cheats, thieves, no good, do nothings, or you know, how do you want to leave it? So there you go. That's my response. No. <laughs> <to> <laughs> yeah, that's good enough. And one thing that's just interesting. I, I, have you heard of the term astroturfing? No. Okay, well, it's a term that's used. It's basically, it's, it's an example. You have like a pharmaceutical drug, and somebody wants to <laughs> check out peer reviews, but the peer reviews are actually a bunch of websites that are published by the pharmaceutical company. Happens right. all the time. So yeah. when I Google you, there'll be a website that pops up, like domesticabusesurvivors.com, and literally, for me, like 15 seconds in, I'm like, Hold on a second. These, this is something's <laughs> up here. And then, then there's ones about Leah, and there's ones about Lawrence Wright, and there's ones about all the other people who've been on your show. Like, yes. tell them about like, they. How many domains do they have? Like, how do they operate like that? They, I mean, Scientology has registered like thousands and thousands of domains, and even people who are still in Scientology, they have the domains registered in case they leave. So. They put up these sites, uh, they spend a lot of money creating these sites and videos and paying for Google ads. For anybody that searches my book or searches my name or searches Leah's name, up pops a Google ad as the number one thing, you know, find out a real story about Mike Rinder. And this, it, it's really interesting, Jeremiah, because this is, what my sort of biggest issue is at this point, which is Scientology's tax exempt status allows them to hide behind the First Amendment and the protections of, look, we, the government can't intrude or interpret our religious beliefs and practices. The only time that they can, they can go beyond that is if those practices are illegal. Now, Scientology is very careful to stick within the borders of legality. They may be immoral, they may be unethical, but generally they're not illegal. However, there is a clause in the IRS code that says in order to qualify for tax exempt status, you have to there's four, there's four basic criteria, but one of them is not be in violation of public policy. Now, public policy is this vaguely defined term of what's acceptable in society. And unfortunately, there is only one case that went to the United States Supreme Court that has defined what public policy is. And it was the case of Bob Jones University. 
And Bob Jones University had uh, racially discriminatory entrance requirements for enrolling in their school. And they had their tax exempt status revoked. And the Supreme Court said, look, you want to keep doing that. That's perfectly within your right. You can believe whatever you want. You don't want to have a racially diverse student body. Go ahead. But the IRS doesn't have to give you exemption for that. That is not exempt. That is in violation of public policy. Now, because of that one case, the interpretation of the law is that violations of public policy are, in, are, are exclusively or, or are only defined as racial discrimination. That cannot be what the law actually is intended to be. It cannot be that a tax exempt organization can spend millions, tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions harassing people, buying, buying smear websites, hiring private investigators to follow them and take their garbage, uh, you know, set up camera surveillance on them, uh, harass them in public or like that. Your tax dollars are subsidizing that. Yours, Jeremiah, Andrew, every person who's listening to this, if you pay taxes in the United States, you are subsidizing those activities. That is a violation of public policy. The IRS should be revoking Scientology's tax exempt status on that basis alone. How, how do they get around, how does the, the, the Scientology organization, organization get around putting people in the hole? Like for two months, three months, there's like testimonies of like you wrote where people are clawing at each other, hitting each other, hurting each other. This is something that you would think would be illegal in every sense. What's the way to get around it? They, do they sign some, does the person in the Sea Org sign something to where they can't char, put charges against the Scientology organization? How does that work? It's, it's hard for me to fathom that. Well, I believe it or not, Andrew, if the FBI busted down the gates and went and took every one of those people and said, hi, I'm an FBI agent. I want you to tell me what's going on here. Are you being held against your will? Are you being, uh, are you being abused? Every single one of them would say no. They would, it, this is what you see in so many of these documentaries. You see the, the Warren Jeffs stuff and what those women and they're like, and this sort of someone comes in and they're howling about the, you know, the child protected services is, is here and they're stealing my children and they're doing this. That, that in the minds of those people, if an FBI agent walked in with a badge and said, I can take you away from here, they would think that they were being taken over the wall into hell. So it's the, it's the mind prison that is the problem. I mean, honestly, Andrew, in 2009, I was working with FBI agents and they asked me that very question. If we went and, and, and sent a team there to go and get these people, what would happen? I described that to them. I said, they said, well, what if you came along and Mark Headley and some of these other people came along with us? They said, they'd look at us just the same. Like we're cockroaches. We're like, we're horrible. We're now suppressive persons that are there to destroy Scientology. And anybody that, that would break ranks to join and walk out the door at that point would would be making a decision that they believed would destroy them for eternity. Yeah. Where do you so, see? Oh, go ahead. No, I'm, that's it. Okay. So that, yeah. there you go. Um, yeah. Just uh, where do you see the future of Scientology uh, post Miscavige area? Think of all the severance and craziness that happened when Miscavige took over. I think he's got to be in his like 60s or early something 60s. like that. early 60s yeah. um like will it even yeah. make it to that because you talk about in your book how it's dwindling there's moments i think it was somewhere where they're making people it was maybe it was you they're going at night because you didn't want to see this one building that spent millions of dollars on was empty um like what is does scientology really even have a future or what does that look like well it has a future because it has a lot of money 
has billions of dollars. It has a lot of property. It has uh, a lot of people that believe in it. And it has, um, you know, ideas. It's hard to kill ideas. You can eradicate abuses, but you can't get rid of ideas quite so easily. And the ideas of Scientology will probably be around forever. There will be some crackpots that will still be still be believing the ideas of Scientology, even if there's no organization left. So the thoughts, the the ideas, the beliefs of Scientology will probably never ultimately go away. I mean, they're in books. They'll be around forever. But the organization will, will continue to dissipate and its, its ultimate you know, destruction or falling apart will occur or be sped up uh, once the tax exempt status is gone. Because the big thing that tax exempt status gives in the United States is, is not money. It is not the money that is important about the exemption. It is the credibility that it gives to Scientology to be a religious tax exempt organization because there is no other, there's no other stamp of religiosity in the United States. The government does not hand out you're the state religion or you're this or you're that. The only place you can get uh, religious bona fides in the United States is by being granted tax exempt status as a 501c3 religious organization by the IRS. And the second thing that grants because of the Church Audits Procedures Act and various other laws is absolute lack of transparency about where your money goes, how much you make, what you spend it on. There are no reporting requirements whatsoever for any religious organization other than their unrelated business income. And that, so Scientology collects billions of dollars, spends it on hiring PIs and lawyers and smear sites and et cetera, et cetera. And nobody knows how much is being spent on that. Not even the Scientology people who give the money. And that is one of the huge things that would change if that information was put out there and people, found out that they had been told, you need to give a million dollars to help with hurricane relief. And they ended up spending 5,000 of the million on, on handing out some bottles of water, but didn't do anything else. That would be the end of Scientology's ability to raise money. Hmm. And then all, the, all that you're mentioning is kind of in the present. Um, we're kind of getting towards where we're up, up here. And I, Mike, I really appreciate you taking the time here. Um, like, what would you like to see though, like within your lifetime, what would you like to see happen? I would like to see the organization basically dismantled, hmm. basically um, put out of business because it is a business. Scientology is absolutely a business and it is a based on a business model. It is based on, you know, there are exact things that you have to buy in Scientology. You get discounts for buying them early. You get discounts for buying a whole bunch of them at once. There are commissions paid to people who uh, bird dog for you. It's like it is a an absolute business modeled uh, quote religion, and that business needs to be shut down because it is the business and the organization that perpetrates the abuses on individuals. It's not the crazy beliefs that are written about by Hubbard in the books or whatever. People can believe anything they want. It's the practices that are formalized within the organizational structure of Scientology that are causing the abuses. That's good, man. We, we, we basically have a quote here, too. I mean, it's on Jerry's hat. My hat's backwards, but it says bad theology uh, hurts people. And... The difference between, I would say, biblical Christianity and these cults like Scientology, uh, Mormonism, even Jehovah's Witnesses, is there's always going to be some business aspect uh, to it. I mean, the biblical gospel is this, Romans 10, 19, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's no X, Y, Z that needs to be obtained through purchases, packages, or the sacrifice of your life, right, <clears throat> to get to the bridge of total freedom. 
the, the biblical gospel is that no, Jesus is God in the flesh who came and he is the bridge to total freedom. And when the sun sets you free, the sun sets you free. Indeed, you don't have to pay for this or pay for that in order to inherit salvation. It's done solely through the work of Christ. Like in Colossians two, it says that Christ, it says, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. This is, this is what a big difference between, I'd say, Scientology and Christianity is right here. It says, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them and him. Scientology does the opposite. They collect your record of debts in auditing and they set them in front of you when you're trying to leave. Jesus died for our debts because he is God in the flesh. And it's, and it's only through him that we can actually have salvation, but it's nothing that I do on my part. It's not me trying to sell something to someone. It's purely by the work of God. And that's the freedom of biblical Christianity. And that's my hope, I guess, Mike, for, for you or for people coming out of Scientology again, because I'm a Christian, right? Is to know that the freedom of the record of debt that stood against you has been set aside, Christ nailing it on the cross through his, through his sacrifice, right? And I think that's a freedom that people can have, uh, actually how Christians can love their neighbors, uh, to people, if they know they're Scientologists, I don't know if they'll know or not, cause they kind of hide it pretty well. It seems like, but if, but you know where your local Scientology building is at, there's one in Utah. This makes me want to go down there and try to get in conversations with these people because it says the gospel is the power of God to salvation. I know Jesus can destroy that, uh, mind prison because, uh, a sound mind is something that God can give. And it's the gospel that can help rescue these people from this mind prison. So I hope this urges anyone who's listening, try to find someone who's a Scientologist, preach the gospel to them that their salvation is not secure through their own works or merits because it's not possible. How can you please an eternal God that way? Uh, Actually, it's the fruits and byproducts of a man-made religion that wants to keep you enslaved. Remember, the mercy of the wicked is cruel. But instead, the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the free gift of God, which is a beautiful thing. So I, I'm thankful again as well, Mike, for you coming on here. Like, like Jerry said, something that has really pushed us to make this podcast was, uh, your guys's A and E series. Like it, it really was, we actually have a, a little show that we do after we record and we actually call it, uh, the aftermath. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it, oh, we, cool. we, yeah, yeah we love I, you. We love you guys. It's yeah. awesome. And actually I just want to give a shout out. There's somebody we are who was on our podcast a couple years back. Her, her name is Jennifer Brewer. She's worked with a group called the UPCI and basically like they, her upbringing, it's essentially, it's a very like legalistic Pentecostal like religion that where the women are basically treated like cattle. Like one thing specifically, like they have to grow out their hair uh, like really long and they can't treat it or anything like that. So when she left, there was so much like PTSD and trauma. Like, can I even show, can I, can I show my forearms? Like that's what she had to go through. And even like her, she started a whole ministry as well too, like helping women who've come out of that. And she actually messaged me and she's like, I she actually gives credit to your show as well too. So I want to say, Mike, like your work is so incredibly appreciated. And I, I do agree with you too. I want to see the Scientology dismantled as well too. Um, uh, any last thoughts or like, where can people also get your book at? It's, it's worth reading. And I did want to say with your accent <laughs> that <laughs> the reason you were dead on with the accent, because that's why I got on audible. <laughs> that's, that's yeah, what well, I would, I would recommend on audible because that's the best way to consume it in my opinion. Well, a lot of people, a lot more people have bought the audible than the, the hardback book, frankly. Anyway, you can get it anywhere. You can get it at bookstores or get it on Amazon or at Barnes and Noble or, at, you know, all of the book outlets have it. So it's a, it's readily available. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed talking to you guys. Uh, this was a, a, a great time and I appreciate the work that you do too. And here's to hoping that the the information age is the end of the cult age. Yeah. Yeah. I'd agree. We need to use technology in a good way to help these people. All right. Well, thank you all guys for listening and I appreciate you again for uh, taking the time, Mike, and I appreciate all that. All right. All that being said, we'll talk to you all next week on cultists where we enter into the kingdom of the cults. Talk to you all soon.